Hi, today we are going to take a look at space-time. Our main questions will be, why can't we just treat time as another space coordinate and what would be the consequences of this? In fact, we will be comparing Euclidean space-time and Mikalskin space-time and we will be seeing what are the consequences of each of the models. In Euclidean space, the square of the distance is computed by a sum of squares. We will assume for now that space-time is just like this. We will call our distance proper time, tau, and c is just a reference speed. In this little exploration, our main tool will be the space-time diagram. We will be using natural units, that is, we will rescale the time axis by our reference speed c. We will try to understand what are the consequences of modeling space-time like a Euclidean space, that is, as if it was just like regular space. We focus mainly on the relationship between two observers, Z and Du, moving at different speeds. The first Z is stationary and the second Du is moving relative to Z at some uniform velocity. Each observer has a measuring stick and a clock with them. Mathematically speaking, these are the unit vectors defining the corresponding reference frames. Z's clock and measuring stick are the two traditional, so to speak, unit vectors. They are orthogonal since space and time are independent directions in space-time. Now, what about Du? He is moving relative to Z with a given velocity v. While in motion, he traces a line in space-time, his so-called world line. From Du's perspective, he is standing still and only moving through time. So his clock is a vector along his word line. We also want his clock to measure unit amounts of time, so its norm must be unitary. Now, how can we make sure that whatever the speed, this identity is respected? Well, we let the clock be expressed using the sine and the cosine functions, which automatically satisfy the equality. Since space and time are independent, the vector corresponding to the measuring stick will be orthogonal. Now, how is theta related to the physics of our problem? Well, from the definition of velocity, we can see that v is equal to the tangent of theta. We will keep this in mind. If we now vary theta, we can see that the lines of constant proper time are circles, and we are prepared to answer a few questions using our model. First, if two moves for one time unit measured in his own clock, what does Z's clock show at that moment? Well, we can see that the event occurred sooner for Z, so time has contracted for him. In Euclidean space, this makes sense. It is simply Pythagoras' theorem. So, we have time contraction. Now, let's imagine that Du is holding a bar of length 1. When he's passing by Z, what length does Z measure for the bar? We can see that Z measures the bar as being larger than 1. This means that there is length dilation. These effects seem weird and do not agree with our day-to-day -day observations, but let's continue. We can see that, according to our model, infinite speeds are allowed, and they correspond to theta equals to half pi or minus half pi. In principle, there is nothing unreasonable about this, at least from our everyday experience, as there are things so fast that seem instantaneous, for example light. So far, what we have found is not too damning. Let us try to understand how our velocity is combined in our spacetime. Consider a third observer, Ne. So, now assume Du moves relative to Z at velocity V, Ne relative to Du at velocity U, and relative to Z at velocity W. In our day-to-day, -day, we just say that W is V plus U. Does our model give the same answer? Consider very small velocities. For this, the formula we found approximates what we experience in our day-to-day, -day. that is, to compose two velocities, we just add them. But at higher velocities, we run into some problems. For example, let theta be pi thirds and gamma pi fourths. This will lead to a negative velocity, and worst, this will be because it is moving backwards in time and not backwards in space. Physically, this means that if Z is standing, Du is moving relative to Z and Ne relative to Du at reasonable velocities for both Du and Ne. From Z's point of view, Ne can be traveling backwards in time. This is not good. 
Besides this, as it turns out, the speed of light is always the same whatever the observer moving at constant velocity. We can see that in our scheme, there is no speed that remains the same whatever the observer. This means that something moving at the speed of light can be moving at any other speed if an appropriate reference frame is chosen, as a change in observer is just a rotation of spacetime. These are pretty damning limitations for our description of spacetime. So now, what can we do? We will follow the suggestions of Einstein and Minkowski and measure distances in spacetime a little differently. Instead of considering the square of the time coordinate, we will consider the symmetric of the square. We will see where this takes us. Consider Z and do again. Z's clock and measuring stick will remain the same, but now do's are different. The sine and the cosine functions won't work because the sum of their squares is constant and we need the difference of their squares to be constant. Luckily, we know the hyperbolic functions, the hyperbolic sine and cosine, so we can write the vector corresponding to do's clock and satisfy the equality for all velocities. The vector corresponding to the measuring stick must be orthogonal to the clock vector. However, it is not the usual orthogonal we are used to. We must consider that lengths are now computed using the difference of the squares. Thus, this measuring stick can be written using the relationship between hyperbolic functions. So now the velocity is given by the hyperbolic tangent of alpha. This parameter is called the rapidity. And if we vary the rapidity, we can see that the lines of constant proper time trace hyperbolas instead of circles now. We now repeat the same questions we posed for the Euclidean model of spacetime. If two moves for one time unit measured in his own clock, what does this clock show at that moment? Well, we can see that now the event occurred later for Z, so time dilated. In our Minkowskian spacetime, the triangle inequality is actually the other way around. Let's again imagine that 2 is holding a bar of length 1. When he is passing by Z, what is the length of the bar? We can see that Z measures the bar as being smaller than 1. This means that there is length contraction. These are precisely the opposite effects to the ones we found before. However, they don't particularly match our day-to-day -day experience. Next, we take a look at the composition of velocities. We consider again Z, Du and Ne. The relative velocities are the same as considered before. Using the same rationale, we can see that, for small velocities, it approximates the rule used in our day-to-day -day experience, that is, we just add the velocities. However, if the two velocities are smaller than the reference speed C, their sum is never larger than C. So we don't run into the problem of our Euclidean model. Finally, we take a look at the fact that the speed of light should be constant whatever the inertial frame of reference chosen. Our model now yields such a result. The velocities c and minus c remain unaltered by the change of observer, the so-called Lorentz transformations. Hence, we can conclude that c is the velocity of light. Said in other words, the eigenvectors of the Lorentz transformations are along the directions corresponding to the speed of light, such that spacetime is contracted or dilated along those lines. Since the speed of light is very large compared to the velocities we experience in our day-to-day, -day, if we rescale the spacetime diagram according to this, we can see that our considerations only become apparent at velocities very close to the speed of light. Although seemingly small, these differences make the Minkowski description of the two, the one that most resembles reality.